My name is Pastor Mark, and we are in the sixth week of examining the greatest commandment. What a wonderfully simple, dynamic command. It's amazing to me when I explore the profoundness of God and the simplicity of His kingdom. We've been breaking this down uh, week after week. It's a two-parter. Love God, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. We have one more week in it. Next week is all the law and all the prophets hang on these commands. So it's sort of putting an exclamation point on it. But today is the end of sort of part two of the command. And last week was love your neighbor. And this week was supposed to be love yourself. But I've changed it a little bit. So stay tuned. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 through 40. We're also going to be in Leviticus, a little Old Testament, 19, 17, and 18. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 and 18. And James chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. Growth is our word for 2024 as pertaining to discipleship. I've said this at the beginning of each week. To disciple, we must become disciples. And to disciple, we must grow in our faith and help others grow in their faith. You don't have to be a pastor to do that. How, you might ask? (laughs) Well, it all starts with a loving relationship with Jesus. That's where it starts. It's the way the greatest commandment starts. Love the Lord your God, heart, soul, mind. And I would add strength in there. When we, when we uh, examined the New Testament, where Jesus quoted, love the Lord your God, heart, soul, mind, versus the Old Testament, where he got it from, that word for mind is, has a lot to do with strength. So I always add strength in there, heart, soul, mind, and strength. So a loving relationship with Jesus sets the tone for our relationships with our neighbors, And to properly love our neighbor as ourselves, we must love God first. We love because He first loved us. It has to start there. Who doesn't want love, right? Like everybody wants love and to feel loved. And think of all the things we attach that word to. Who do you love? What do you love? If God is not first, you are building on a shaky foundation. He has to be first. So loving God with everything that we are, heart, soul, mind, and strength, means we have to yield our soul. And from what I see, the two mechanisms that guide our soul... When he says heart, soul, and mind, the soul's in the middle. The heart's part of the soul. The mind's part of the soul. It's like being in a rowboat. And your boat's the soul, and you've got your impulse decisions got one row, and your critical thinking's got the other. They better be balanced. As a matter of fact, you should be sitting in the boat watching God row it and have His mind before you ever attempt to take the oars. It's a yielding. It's a surrender. God will draw you. You have to be drawn by God. But you've got to draw near to Him first before He draws near to you. He's drawing. He's out there calling. He's, He's made it evident when you look at nature and creation. Man has no excuse. Romans 1.20 thereabouts. He's always drawing. What are you doing about the draw? Draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. That you do that first. And it works like two plus two works. Trust me. I've spent an entire lifetime of whoop, near, far, near, far. Finally figure out, just stay near. Stay near. Stay near. 
Our neighbors need God's love through us, not our version of love. Let me say that again. Our neighbors need God's version of love through us, not our version of love. Matthew 22, starting in verse 37. Jesus was asked point blank, trying to be tricked by the Pharisees. What's the greatest commandment? And he says, replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Got to get that first. And the second's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Again, simple dynamics. Do you know what all the law and all the prophets looks like in your Bible? It's two-thirds of it. All the law and all the prophets hang on those two commands. How important is the greatest commandment? Like I said, last week we looked at loving our neighbor, and this week was originally slated to explore loving ourselves. The greatest commandment, we've been exploring it in sections, but it is one command in two parts that's got to be taken as a whole. So I don't want you to forget that. That's why I was hesitant how I approach love yourself. Love of God is the first and greatest commandment. Our love of God must be sincere, not just thoughts and words. And all of our love, all the love that we could possibly manufacture is too little to bestow upon Him. Therefore, all the powers of our soul must be put off and mortified. The old has passed and the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17 There is a self-love which is our duty. We must have a due concern for the welfare of our souls and our bodies. And we must love our neighbor as truly and sincerely as we love ourselves. In many cases, we must deny ourselves for the good of others. Let's see what... The Old Testament has to say about it. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly, so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is where Bible study gets fun. When Jesus quoted, when he stated the greatest commandment, this is so curious, he referred to two Old Testament scriptures, okay? Loving God, heart, soul, and strength comes from Deuteronomy. And perhaps the most well-known passage for any Israelite. Like seriously, that's the Shema. Hear, O Israel, our Lord, our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Like, that's an obvious one. I'll bet when the Pharisee asked him the question and he heard that coming out, he was like, oh, that's easy. Nice one. Real, uh, you know, original there. But still, powerful. Very powerful command. <laughs> But the second passage, the second quote he uses from Leviticus here is far less known. It's amazing. It's, <laughs> if you've got an NI version, go to the top of uh, Leviticus 19. I have it misquoted in my notes, Deuteronomy. It's Leviticus 19. It's titled, the entire chapter is titled Various Laws, right? Like this... Laundry list of laws. Here's all the big laws, and then all in Leviticus 19, here's, a, here's various laws. <laughs> and the loving your neighbor as yourself is down the list. It's right here. It's in verse 18. Verse 18. 
And the Hebrew word for neighbor in the Old Testament meant a fellow Israelite. <laughs> but the Greek word that Jesus used for love your neighbor means everybody, regardless. He actually took the most famous commandment, tied it to, in the old Hebrew mind, sort of one down the list, but he elevated that. And I believe there's a reason for that. It's God's plan for us. He changed the meaning of neighbor, and he took an obscure command and elevated it to the second highest. That's big. That's noteworthy, Christian. I'll bet that was noteworthy for the Pharisees. As a matter of fact, in the context of the argument that he had, arguments that he had with the Pharisees, it was their lack of true love for others. The fact that they got their noses out of joint because he healed a blind man on the Sabbath. <laughs> Never mind, the man was blind since birth and received a miracle from God. Oh, you were working on the Sabbath. That's a sin. I'll bet when they heard that second commandment elevated up there like, whoa. A little bit of a smack in the face, actually. Because they weren't very good at loving their, not only everyone, <laughs> neighbor, but even their, their, own, their own kind. They put ritual and tradition above love. Do we do the same? Why is it that it takes night to shine to bring out the best in a lot of people? Why isn't every day a day to shine for Jesus Christ and His people? And to shine His light? And to celebrate His goodness with others? That's the heart of loving your neighbor as yourself. Various laws. Interesting. So here we are as Christians. The greatest commandment, the second one like it, and we find ourselves in the middle. Curious. What position is that Jesus took in the middle <laughs> of deity and mankind? He puts us there too. Take up your cross and follow me. We're between God and man, commanded to love both. But here's the thing. I think we get the wrong picture. We see this as that love coming here and going there and coming here and going there. Or may, we may receive it here and leave it here and then it's a conduit. It starts with God. And I'm convinced that until you're filled up on the love of God and how much He loves you and you surrender to that, it's not going to transfer to your neighbor and yourself. It won't. That's why I didn't separate love yourself. Because you've got to get loving God first. And then notice, the neighbor is before yourself. We're conduits between God's God and man. Surrendering to and receiving God's love... Do you receive it? Do you know how precious it is? Do you know what Jesus went through for you? Each and every one of you, while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. So receiving that and then demonstrating it to our neighbors. Until you receive that, what you do with your neighbors is ceremonial. It's pharisaical. It's contrived. And there are a lot of people that do a lot of good. But if it's not in Jesus' name, it's eternally worthless. Sorry. The love we are to have for our neighbor and ourselves is linked to God's individual plan for us and His will for all mankind. You don't receive God's love just so you can go off and Love whoever, however you want, in all of its sordid meanings. This is agape love. This is sacrificial love. And it's not a love that makes us a doormat to be walked on. Don't get me wrong. We must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to others who are abusing us. 
You're doing this, this, and this to me, and it hurts my feelings. I don't like it. Can you please stop? You don't have to yell or call out somebody on Facebook. If you have a problem with somebody, go to them. Speak the truth in love. Restore a neighbor gently. This love we are to have for our neighbor and ourselves is linked to God's individual plan for us and His will for mankind. It's not your idea of love. It's His idea of love. And loving your neighbor and yourself is His idea of how you are to love yourself. Your body's a temple. Take care of your body. Mark Pritchard, stop eating so much dang pizza. <laughs> I try. Every day is a new day. We have one of our deacons who prays for me all the time, and he prays that Jesus would meet me in my time of need. And it always just, I always loved that. I don't know why, and today it hit me. I need thee every hour, most precious Lord. Every hour, every minute I need thee. My time of need is all the time, Lord. Fill me. Fill me up so I can shine your light. When hard times come and waves comes against me and I don't feel good about who I am or my plan, Lord, fill me up. It's not about me. It's about you. It's about your love. This is not heaven. Close this up. James chapter 2, 14 through 19. A very famous passage. You've most likely heard it before. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there's one God? Good! Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. Man, I love that verse. I believe in God. Good! So does the devil. What are you doing to show that you believe in God? This passage demonstrates God's plan for loving our neighbor as ourselves. First and foremost, Hebrews 11:6, without faith it's impossible to please God. This passage is not diminishing the importance of faith. It's just showing what true faith looks like. Faith is more than a thought. Faith is more than a notion. I believe in God, and I'm going to go off and live as bad as I want and do nothing for nobody else but me, but I believe in God. No, no, I don't think so. By your fruit, you will be judged. Faith is more than well wishes. Saving faith always includes deeds designed to help others. Designed to help others. How many times have you said you would pray for somebody but never did? I used to, like... It's hard to admit that as a pastor. It's been years since I've de- done it, but I've done it. Oh, I'll pray for that. La, 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 la. It's all about me. <laughs> Say you're going to pray for somebody, do it. As a matter of fact, do it on the spot. <laughs> you mind if I put my hand on your shoulder and we pray right now? I think I may have been turned down once, but... Maybe one out of a thousand. Might have got some weird looks or like, "Mm -hmm." but when we were done praying, they were thankful. Has the Holy Spirit prompted you to step into a situation where someone needs help, but you didn't follow through? (sighs) I've done it. I've been there. Next time it comes around, step in. 
even if you know it's going to be messy and get you out of your comfort zone, guess what? That's when you know you need God. Because if it's something you can do on your own without God's help, then I'm telling you it might be a little part of His plan, but it's not His plan. His plan for you will always re require dependency on Him to fill in the gaps. And the more you trust that and step out in that, your plan gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and you look back five years ago at that little part of your plan that scared you to death, and that's nothing. Simple, dynamic kingdom stuff. <laughs> Love that God desires is about the eternal welfare of our souls and those we impact. It's not about our selfish passions or obsessions, but about truly caring for others who are hurting. And all of us are hurting in some way and need the love of God. Will you show it? Navigators. <laughs> Navigators Wednesday after school program starts this Wednesday for 13 weeks. And it's a lot. I have a sign-up sheet. It's just a general sheet. If you haven't signed up, when the service is over, let me tell you what. The Holy Spirit speaking when Friday night God gives this powerful demonstration of how you love your neighbor as yourself and then a program where an opportunity to love your neighbor as yourself in a different way is starting. That's the Holy Spirit. That's how He works. You're here today for a reason. I know some of you work your tail off for the kingdom. Don't get guilt tripped. But if the Holy Spirit's like, hey man, today's your day. Navigator's starting Wednesday. You've got something to offer. Take that leap of faith. That's Him talking. This is not, earth is not a place to just get by till Jesus comes back. That attitude drives me nuts. How you doing today? Oh, just waiting for Jesus to come back. Matlock comes on at 7. <laughs> There's more. There's more to life. We all know it. The more is stepping into his plan for you. It's a roller coaster ride every day. Navigators, sign up after the service. You got to get a background check. Um... But there's our neighbors coming through our doors. There are many kids who aren't always warm or well fed that will be experiencing the love of God indeed. Like, this is where the good stuff's happening. Kids coming off the street from some homes that aren't homes. Sometimes the only meal they get is at school or navigators. Sometimes the only love, the only Jesus they see is at Navigators. There's one kid came in one day and he hugs me and, Pastor Mark, you're like my second dad. Oh, wait, I, I got two dads. You're, you're like my third dad. <laughs> Gives me a big hug. Mm. Man, that's good. That's God. <laughs> I remember being in church and School And there were certain Christian men who made an influence on my life. I'll never forget them. I won't. Or women. Many of them passed away now. Don't you want to be one of those for a kid? Like, man, what better way to go meet your maker than to have a bunch of kids who you made a difference in their life for in Jesus Christ? And that opportunity exists every day. Well, Wednesdays. <laughs> but every day somewhere. Faith alone isn't enough. May today be the day God breaks your heart for what breaks His. I was warned not to pray for that. That's a silly thing to say, don't pray for that. Yes, break my heart for what breaks yours, Lord. That's what it takes to get rid of those blinders and the selfishness. Open my eyes that I may see. May He prompt you to step into the spiritual gifts that you have and use them indeed to help others in His name. Maybe children and youth ain't your thing. 
Maybe it's a men's study. Or maybe you can just share your life skill, come in for 30 minutes and show the kids what you do for a living. And who knows, maybe one of them kids, it's God's plan for them to step into that. And you were the one who motivated them to step into their future career. Jesus demonstrated his love by dying on a cross for us. And we've got to surrender to that love wholeheartedly before we can properly love our neighbors as ourselves. If you're having trouble loving yourself and loving your neighbor, I would strongly uh, encourage you to learn how much God, the love God showed you so you can properly love him and get in relationship with him. Until you get there, this is going to be a struggle, loving your neighbor and yourself. John, who wrote the book of John, and John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation, called himself the disciple Jesus loved. This is proper self-love. And when I first read that, I was like, oh, okay, John, you go. John called him the self, the disciple Jesus loved, not because he elevated himself above the others. He received and surrendered to that love. He received it. He completely got rid of the old John and everything that made John who he was. And he completely took on the nature of Christ. So much so, in fact, that he wrote my favorite of the four Gospels. And John, 1 John, if you're wondering about your uh, salvation, read 1 John. The disciple Jesus loved. You should refer to yourself as the person Jesus loves. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They're weak, but he is strong. Receive him as a child. Step back into that surrendered Attitude and allow him to fill you with his goodness. Will you surrender to Jesus' love so you can apply it and share it? Believing there's one God is good, but even the demons have that belief and they hate God. (laughs) It's too late for them, but it's not too late for you. Holy Spirit showed me something today that blew my mind. I love tying Scripture together, and I believe this is proper. The Bible says Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith, right? Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is fully God, right? God is love. Therefore, the author and perfecter of your faith is love. God, that's good. Oh, man, that is good, good stuff. The author and perfecter of your faith is love. You better default to love, people, because this world is doing so much to fill your brains with hate and division. It's beyond belief. I've never seen the likes. And it's straight from the enemy. He wants to make us love less, hope less, faith less. No, I say no. Love conquers all. (laughs) Love conquers all. Ask Him to break your heart for what breaks His. Ask Him to intimately make you aware of His all-consuming love and receive it. We're all broken in a million pieces. And we desperately want to be put back together and made whole. God's got to have every piece. What are you holding on to? What's holding you back from surrendering to His love so you can receive love, so you can give love? And it's never ending. Like rivers of living water is His Holy Spirit. And guess what, Christian? When you receive Jesus, love lives here. <laughs> it lives here. It's, he's in there. What are you doing about it? Let's pray. God, thank you that 
You are the author and perfecter of our faith. And the main driving force of that is love, Lord. Agape love, sacrificial love, love that takes action, love that is the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, love that is the body of Christ. We are all members and Christ is at the head. May we indeed be a complete body here at Toronto, Crossroads, North River. May we take this community, Lord, that you have ordained to be ministered to and be your hands and feet, be your light, be the bride of Christ, holy and spotless, set apart, Lord. When people see the acts and deeds of this church and its members, may they see and sense Jesus Christ, Lord. May you change lives in this town. We love you and praise you and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.